Okay, thank you everyone. Uh, like she said, I'm uh, Jake Pummel. I'm a graduate student here at the University of Texas at Austin uh, studying computational astrophysics, basically. Um, hopefully I'm going to drop the uh, student part from that very soon, but not quite there yet. Um, I'm here to talk to you guys today about a tool that I've developed for my own research that, to make my life easier that hopefully someone out there will uh, find it useful as well. Um, PyGadget is a Python library for reading gadget HDF5 files into a pandas data frame. Now, if you don't want to get gadget HDF5 file is, don't worry about that, I'll get to that later. But uh, pandas is becoming, or is already, the de facto standard for data analysis in Python, and it's got broad support across the scientific computing ecosystem. Um, and if we can more painlessly get our data into pandas, then we can more effectively leverage the rest of the tools in the ecosystem, more easily use things like scikit-learn and things like that, uh, things that already are built on top of pandas to some extent that use it. All right. What PyGadget is not is a full-fledged um, data analysis package like uh, YT or PenBody. The whole point of this is just to get the data out of the files into pandas in a painless manner so that we can analyze it in pandas. All right. So a little bit of background uh, since I'm in the general session here. The goal here is to understand basically how the first galaxies and before that the first stars form um, so that when this telescope here, this is a life-size re life size replica of the, uh, the James Webb Space Telescope when it was on Auditorium Shores a couple years ago. If you can see at the bottom there, there are a couple of people there for scale. Um, um, so we, whenever that launches, it's going to be Hubble's, the successor to Hubble, and we're going to be see, able to see further out into the universe than we've ever been able to see before. And so we want to figure out what it is that we're, we want to have some idea of what we're going to see when that happens. Um, and it turns out that th based on theory and stuff, we haven't seen these yet, but it seems like the first stars represent a bit of a bottleneck in our understanding of the evolution of the universe. Um, their properties are very sensitive to the initial conditions of the universe, i.e. the Big Bang, um, and they have an outsized impact on everything that happens after them as well. Um, this is a very hard problem covering literally astronomical range of physical scales. Uh, basically the problem is how do we get from this, this is a picture of the Big Bang, uh, the, uh, sorry, uh, this is a picture of the cosmic microwave background, um, basically the universe's baby picture uh, from roughly 400,000 years after the Big Bang. In, uh, for contrast, we, the Big Bang was 13.8 billion years ago. Um, so this is basically 13.7 billion years in the past. And the question is, how do we get from that to down to the scales of individual stars? This is a picture from Hubble of a, a star cluster. So how do we get to this? Um, and the problem here is you're trying to go from cosmological scales and you need to keep information about things on cosmological scales and zoom all the way in to basically the size of a star. And that's a range of 10 to the 7 orders of magnitude, or you have to zoom in by a factor of 10 million. So that's a pretty difficult problem. Um, so to break, to uh, deal with a problem like this, we, do, we use numerical techniques, break one big pro complex problem up into millions of small, simple ones by discretizing the system in time and space. And one way to do this, the method I use is called uh, smooth particle hydrodynamics. Basically, you trace the system with a bunch of, use a bunch of tracer particles. Here's an example of this. Uh, a bunch of particles representing water droplet falling into some other water um, and creating waves and stuff. And basically what's happening here is you're, you're uh, calculating the interactions between nearby particles and it recreates the, represent the, uh, the behavior of the system you would expect whenever you uh, drop water in, into a pond or something like that. So, okay. So the code I use to do this is something called Gadget2. It's massively MPI parallel uh, in body plus smooth particle hydrodynamics code. It's written in C. There are extra, you can add extra physics modules. Sometimes those are in Fortran, but it's all in C and Fortran for speed. Um, and it's widely used, at least within the astronomical community. It's widely used to study a variety of astrophysical problems. Um, mostly star and galaxy formation because it's very well suited to that type of problem. Um, but simulations can run anywhere from 100,000 hours to 10 billion CPU, uh, sorry, particles, um, depending on the size of the problem. Um, and you can take anywhere from 1,000 to 10 million CPU hours. Um, and the code, what the code produces is a 
set a series of regular snapshots, basically the full state of the physical system um, at different points in time. And those can be anywhere from megabytes to terabytes in size. Um, and it's easily customizable, relatively speaking. Um, not easy, but easier. Um, it gets used a lot. Um, and one of the nice things about it is that the snapshot, snapshot files that you get out can be saved in the HDF5 file format. Or if you really hate your collaborators, you could use the, the binary format, but whatever. Uh, my simulators are smack in the middle of this. Uh, 25 million particles or so. Uh, it takes two, roughly two days to run on 256 cores. That's around 10,000 CPU hours. Um, and at the end of it, I get around like 2,000 snapshots out. Uh, two or three gigabytes each for roughly a, a data set size of around five terabytes. Um, obviously, I can't run this on my desktop computer. It would take forever. Um, so I actually get to run these on the supercomputer, the Stampede supercomputer that's up at the Texas Advanced Computing Center. Uh, it's the number fat, some fastest uh, supercomputer in the world. I like getting to tell people that I run uh, simulations on that. Uh, now let's talk about data. No? Okay. All right, uh, gadget snapshot files are composed of several HDF5 groups, um, one for each particle type, uh, plus a header. So the header contains necessary simulation metadata that is stored as HDF5 attributes. Then you have part type zero, part type one. Um, type zero is typically gas particles, SPH particles. Um, part type one is typically dark matter in body particles. Um, and you can have as many other uh, particle types as you want. Typically one that some people sometimes have is stars, for example. Um, and these particle fields include every, 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 uh, every particle type has to have a particle ID. Um, any sort of in-body particle has to have masses and coordinates and velocities. Smooth particles uh, to represent gas have to have density, a smoothing length, uh, internal energy, and adiabatic index. And you can have a variety of other custom fields. One that I have is I have a bunch of chemical abundances included in mine. Um, simulation data is often big, but it's not unmanageable. Um, PyGadget is designed with this sort of medium data in mind, if you'll forgive the buzzword. Um, HDF5 allows us to load only the data we're interested in. Um, the library is designed to refine the data as loaded to save memory along the way, um, so you don't run out. So you can actually do this on a laptop. Um, and then data frames actually do a really good job of helping keep the data aligned as we load, refine, drop fields as we do our analysis. We can do it interactively and not run out of memory. Um, and then one other nice thing is that you can do parallel batch processing, processing via Python's multi-processing module. Um, in addition, um, PyGadget also provides tools for coordinate transformations. Um, it turns out this is kind of a tricky problem, so I've just packaged it. I do it all the time, and it can be a real pain, so it's in there so I don't have to worry about it. Um, basically, conversions from co-moving to physical coordinates, uh, recentering the box, the coordinates in the box, um, rotations around arbitrary axes, which is actually a lot simpler to do here than it is in some other sim simulation codes, um, and doing conversions to cylindr cylindrical spherical coordinates, things like that. Um, and in addition, one thing that's kind of difficult to do with SPH uh, simulation data is visualization. So I have a couple of routines in here. Um, for doing that. It's really slow. You have to do a triply nested for loop over however many million particles you're trying to visualize. So it's written in C, parallelized with OpenMP, and wrapped in SciPy Weave. That can be kind of messy to get installed. So in addition, there's a pure, pure Python routine that's JIT compiled uh, using Numba, and it's only, it's only twice as slow as the OpenMP version, which is pretty, pretty darn good. So Thank you to the Continuum folks for that. Um, so, demo time. Let's, uh, let's test fate. All right, so we can import PyGadget. Okay, great. Oop, I need to restart the kernel. Okay, everything's nice and fresh now. Okay, great. Uh, initialize the simulation metadata. One of the things that that does is give you a list of all the snapshot files that you have in whatever location on the computer you told it to look. Um, then you open a snapshot file. Okay, all that's doing is opening up and reading in the header. Um, there's no data loaded yet. We can expect the, inspect the things that are in the header, things like the number of particles in the file, um, cosmological parameters, redshift, et cetera, things like that. Um, 
So there's no data loaded yet, right? These are, we have snap dark matter, that's a, a data frame that we're gonna put dark matter particles in. Gas is gonna go in a separate one, um, and they're both empty data frames at the moment. All right, so let's go ahead and load some data. Um, and we can look at that. Okay, great, these are masses in, in um, uh, solar masses. Um, and you can load several fields at a time. You don't have to do one at a time. You can do some sort of batch processing sort of thing. Uh, that takes a while because it has to read in six fields, six times 13 million here. Um, okay, so you, we've got some masses, coordinates, velocities in there, X, Y, Z, U, V, W, Cartesian co regular Cartesian coordinates. Um, and one of the nice thing that I've got this set up to do is that you can load any quantity that exists in your HDF5 file. It doesn't have to be defined in uh, PyGadget. You just don't get any of the conversions, uh, convenience functions to deal with it. It'll just load the raw data. So you can do that by load quantity like that. I don't have any in here though, so I'm not actually gonna execute that. All right, so let's look at what we've got here. We have 13 million particles in here, um, several uh, fields. And one of the things that I do all the time is you gotta refine your data. You, you run out of memory you, or you only want certain fields or certain particles. So you wanna be able to do that on the fly. Uh, that's what uh, this does. Um, this is just taking out the most, the hot, most highest resolution particles, but you can, uh, you can do, you can define your own refinement criterion as well. Um, okay, so now we only have eight million particles loaded. Great, Let half as much memory is being used. All right, uh, we can see that here. We've only got the lowest mass particles in there. Um, you can load derived fields as well. Uh, temperature, for example, that depends on the eternal energy of a particle, uh, the adiabatic index, and in our, my case, abundances. Um, so it has to load all that stuff, takes a minute. But as soon as it's loaded, this is the slow part. <laughs> has to do a bunch of calculations. Um, okay, now it's loaded everything and it's done the calculations that it needs to do. And we have all this um, extra information that it's loaded. It's loaded all the abundances. And now we have the temperature down here at the end. All right. Um, so one nice thing is that all these newly loaded fields are all nicely indexed properly. So everything is, we've only taken in the highest resolution uh, values for each of those, only the highest resolution particles for each of those fields. All right. Uh, we got some coordinate transformations available as well. Uh, you can convert, for example, to spherical coordinates. So now we have in here masses, um, particles at, at the end. We've got our spherical coordinates, r, theta, phi. Um, and also very nice is that we can uh, uh, clean up unneeded fields to save memory. Um, so that's what this, oops, uh, that's what this one does. Um, any, if you pass clean up a, a, a selection of fields, it will exclude those fields from being deleted. So it'll keep those in memory. Um, all right, so now we've gotten rid of everything except for the masses and the temperature data. So now I can go and do some analysis on that, and I'm not, and I can now load additional snapshots as well because I'm not hogging all the memory on the system. So I can do things in in uh, a batch kind of manner. All right, um, and that's it for the demo for the moment. Um, all right, so PyGadget is available on GitHub um, at github.com slash Hummel, that's my username, uh, PyGadget, and thank you very much. So th this is something that I thought quite a bit about. Okay, so the, the question was, is there any possibility to uh, support the gadgets binary format as well? Um, and this is something that I've thought about and looked at doing. Um, the problem is, is that different people have different formats. And so basically you have to go to their simulation, pull out the IO um, functions so that you get the headers right and everything and uh, basically load, use that to figure out where, where things are in the file. And so that can be a bit of a pain, so I haven't gotten around to doing that. Um, it might be on the to-do list, but down the road, because it's fairly easy to once uh, you have, if you get binary data, you can run 
gadget for a very brief period of time, and basically you get one snapshot out, and you can save it out as HTTP5, so you can let gadget do the conversion for you instead. So that's that's my approach typically. Yeah, I kind of skipped over it. So the question was, uh, how did I actually do the Panda's integration with the data frame? And uh, basically what I did is I subclassed the data frame and added some convenience functions for loading data on top of it. So for example, um, oh, there are too many tabs open here, I can't see them. Well, basically I initialize a, uh, Nope. Oh. Eh, whatever. It's there. I can't get to it. There we go. Okay. Yeah. 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 So that so that you can do the batch processing, you have to you have to take care of pickling. Um, so basically, you load it in. Um, uh, the base uh, 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 subclass is a data frame, and basically set it up, initialize a data frame with an index using the particle IDs that are defined in the uh, HDF55. So that's how we do it. So I feel like this is qu basically the polar opposite of Blaze, um, where I'm trying to do one very specific thing. Um, and I don't know how relevant this is because there's a specific format that Gadget uses to save things in those HDF5 files. And I'm not quite sure what a great way to generalize this would be. Um, but if you generally have things in HDF5 files, I, I know Blaze and, and Dask and some of these, these tools that Continuum is, and uh, others are developing are, are good at doing these sorts of things, um, especially if it's like pie tables or something like that. That's where you have a uh, standardized format. So. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right.